thank you guys uh, for joining us for Demystifying Data in Programmatic Media. Uh, I realize this is now your fifth Insight Lab of the day, so <laughs> hang on, we're getting closer. Only one more after this. Bear with us. We'll try to, try to keep the energy up a little bit. We know it's after lunch and everybody's tired. Um, but by way of introduction, uh, I am a relative newcomer to iProspect, so my name is Dylan Lockett. I'm the uh, VP and head of display for iProspect in the US. This is my first ever client summit. Uh, and I'm the OG of Display. I'm Melissa Watson. I'm a senior director of Display out of our Fort Worth office. I've been with iProspect for almost nine years now, specializing in Display for the last five. Cool. So what we want to talk to you about today is really around data and personalization. You're probably like, oh, great, another one. Like, <laughs> we, we get it, right? Like, we've talked about it a lot, but Melissa and I sit a lot closer to the like, actual tactical activation. So we want to try to bring it to light a little bit differently for you and ultimately like, kind of bring this abstract concept out of the clouds and give you some tangible examples for how using data and personalization can actually drive results in your media. Uh, so just to address the elephant in the room, first and foremost, like programmatic is a huge buzzword. And you can see just from a search trends perspective, it has blown up, it is going to continue to blow up, uh, and there are a ton of misconceptions about it. I mean, I have quote unquote programmatic <coughs> HR companies reaching out to me to do recruiting. Like it, this term has just become so nebulous. And I would honestly say it's probably supplanted the year of mobile for like most inaccurate and annoying buzzword in the industry. Um, so you know it, it is extremely topical, but why is there so much attention being paid to it? Well, really, the, the promise of programmatic was around control, and control in a lot of different ways, right? So one, one is around advertisers being able to exercise control over their working media spend. And, you know, get transparency into pricing and understand how their dollars are actually going towards working media or, you know, ultimately how they aren't. Um, there's control from an agency perspective where it allows our people to, you know, visual pun intended, like put their hands on the levers to drive results for our clients because we sit so close and we know the business so well. But it's still this very abstract concept, right? And there's still a ton of buzzwords that go into it. And one that we really want to focus on today is around transparency. So what goes into transparency? Well, we could have a lot of different definitions, and we've talked about it on the main stage, and everybody's kind of talked about it a little differently. But from a programmatic media perspective, like at iProspect, we really think that there are three core components to transparency. So first and foremost, pricing. Pricing is like the biggest watershed moment for programmatic over the past couple of years. Because you had incredibly damning reports come out, like the ANA's K2 report on transparency, where advertisers started to understand for the first time like what the margins are on display media and where those dollars are going. And it led to wholesale change in pricing models, where now we're working on transparent fixed fees and advertisers understand exactly where the dollars are going in the supply chain. Uh, from there, you know, really the, the hot topic for the past two years or so has been around inventory. And this is a great way for advertisers to exercise control and programmatic by understanding exactly where your ads are running, getting domain and site level transparency, and making sure that it's on brand safe and high quality inventory. So inventory has been a massive focus, but ultimately like, where we think the conversation is going to go next is around transparency and data. And this is what we want to bring to you guys today so that you can start understanding the implications of that and ultimately like, be the thought leaders. Like, we have the chance to be at the forefront of this. Like, as the conversation starts, we can be leading it. So that's what we want to talk about today. Everybody loves a good agenda slide. So <laughs> two main components of this presentation. One, we're going to dig into the data. And two, we are going to personalize our activation. Uh, so. Let's dig into the data. So everybody's favorite MarTech ecosystem slide uh, should look really familiar because Joel put it on the main stage yesterday. Uh, that's one of the downfalls of being a second day presenter is that sometimes your <laughs> content shows up in unexpected places. But we love this slide. Uh, it is purposefully obtuse and very confusing. Like Even if you just drill into the data section specifically, uh, there are so many logos there, so many companies, it's impossible to keep track of. Like, by the time we come out of this lab, half of these companies are either going to have been acquired, sold off, closed their doors, rebranded, or otherwise <laughs> changed. So it, it's just a really confusing space. And even if we just 
uh, drill into like audience marketing specifically, there are so many providers here and every single one of them offer <coughs> Uh, brand safe, high quality, exclusive, proprietary, GDPR compliant data. And it really kind of begs the question of like, with all of these different data sources, like what do they actually tell us? And this is, I think, where we have the opportunity to bring this abstract concept of data down and do a little bit more of a tangible example. Uh, so we wanted to bring an actual user profile to life. Uh, we talk about marketing to people and not proxies. What does that look like visually? Uh, so had a little prep time for this, pulled together a user profile for someone in this room. Uh, these are actual data attributes from BlueKai. Here's what it looks like. So our user is a 60-something working woman represented here by the beautiful Meryl Streep. Uh, she, is a, she is a cat owner. She is big into scrapbooking and paper crafts. Uh, she, she loves college hoops and uh, also a golf lover too. So again, we start talking about marketing to people and not proxies. Like you can start to kind of get a visual picture for who this person is, right? Kind of coming to life, kind of makes sense. Oh, there's there's one small problem. Like this is my data profile. Uh, this is this is what Blue Kai knows about me. Um, so hopefully, this is raising some eyebrows. Like. Uh, I am certainly not as beautiful nor as talented as Meryl Streep, so that's doing her a massive disservice. But there are some attributes here that are good, right? Like, I am a huge golf lover, got to play the Broadmoor course on Sunday, it was terrible, let's not talk about it. Um, my play was terrible, the course was amazing. Um, and I do love watching college hoops. So how do we take the good and keep it, and how do we kind of get rid of all of the bad, right? Like, what does a more accurate data profile for me look like? Well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, much more of a dog person than a cat person. Uh, kind of going through a weird midlife crisis where I got into sneaker collecting, so you know, strongly identify with men's shoes. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, pretty heavily indexed in the Chris Hemsworth demographic. <laughs> Ruggedly handsome, heavily muscled. Okay, we're supposed to be authentic, so maybe, maybe more like Richard. <laughs> Fine. The point is, I'm male, right? Uh, I am a business traveler, and uh, you know, whenever I travel, I, I typically always stay at a Hilton, so I'm a Hilton loyalist. So this is a much more accurate data profile for me, right? So how do we start to, you know, really separate the signal from the noise? And Drew, you know, I heard you say that on the main stage this morning, so glad we were on the same page there. But it's a great way to think about it, right? Like, you have all this extraneous noise, but then you have really valuable signals. So how do we market to that? Well, surprise, surprise, people, not proxies. Uh, you know, and again, like, <laughs> bear with us here. Like, we have to start marketing to people. And yes, uh, the only way that I was going to feel comfortable with my picture in this slide is if there was a puppy. So I'm heavily pandering here. Like, focus on the puppy. It's awful cute. His name's Mac. Um, but. This is really you know, the foundation of everything that we do. And, and hopefully we're bringing this to life for you a, a little bit differently than you've seen so far. But what underpins all of this and enables us to do that is the data source through M1. So it starts at the household level and it is all based in PII. So when we're talking about like people and not proxies, like this knows me down to the PII level. And it takes all of these different data sources and amalgamates them to keep the good and strip out the bad. So, you know, again, visual pun, here's my MID, right? Like, this is what my virtual profile looks like, and it's an accurate representation of me because it's matched down to the household level, and it's persistent. So, like, when I moved from Texas to D.C. last fall, my profile updates along with that. I don't start a wholesale <coughs> new one. Uh, so, uh, you know, honestly, a really great way for you guys to, to take this back and, like, a fun exercise to do, go to bluekai.com slash registry and see what your data profile looks like. You can do it now if this lab starts to drag, or maybe in another one that's less exciting. <laughs> but you can really start to see like, all of those different attributes that Blue Kai knows about you. And take it a step further and do it on your desktop when you get back to work. You're going to see vastly different pictures. And that's what we're talking about with people, not proxies. Like, you are the same person on your mobile phone and your desktop, so why should Blue Kai identify you differently? That's really the issue that is kind of foundational that we're trying to crack through. So again, like through the MID process, leveraging M1, you can take all of the bad, 
all of the good, strip it out, and leave yourself with a really confident feeling that you're reaching exactly the user that you intend in the right way at the right time. So, you know, talking about personalizing your activation, I think everybody in this room could likely agree, like all the audience segmentation, all of the amazing data you can get is maybe 50% of the battle if you do not personalize your activation. Like you can know all this stuff, you can have all this great data, but it's just gonna fall flat if you don't actually find a way to activate on that. So how do we do that? We have to start this conversation talking about creative. Um, you guys have seen a lot of stats so far this week that are supposed to kind of scare you into doing something. Um, I think this is not a surprise for anybody. We all get chased around the internet with display ads, right? The average internet user sees 63 display ads a day. So what this means is, again, we have to listen to that data, and that data is, is our consumers. We have to listen to our consumers and actually start creating a relevant conversation with them. Otherwise, it's, it's only gonna take us so far to have great and amazing data. You gotta make sure you have the right data. So again, with Dylan and his original profile, Walmart might be trying to convince him to use his ARP discount to buy cat-themed <laughs> scrapbooking utensils, right? So best case scenario, Dylan doesn't even see this because he's seen 22 other, 62 other ads today, right? Worst case scenario, he sees it and he's offended. Like, some of you guys know Dylan, some you don't. His face pretty much always looks sad, but like it would <laughs> look extra sad in this instance, right? Working on it as a person. Yeah. <laughs> They're a little Eeyore. Um, good data in is gonna have a much more relevant conversation, right? He is a business traveler, he has a puppy. So it's important for him to be able to keep an eye on his little floofer when he's traveling, maybe give him a treat from time to time whenever he looks extra sad or lonely. So. Again, you guys can understand like the importance and how much different of a, of a relationship Dylan is going to start building with brand if they're actually able to have a conversation with him that's relevant to him in that moment. We understand that most of you in this room, if you could have a thousand different creative assets that were completely customized, you would do it, right? And you know, you would all love to think that all of your data is amazing and extremely accurate, but most people are just probably not there today. So how do we, again, take this down to what can you start doing today? Um, and I think the best way to look at it is just start with your good, better, best. Like, demographic and geographic information is good. It's helpful. It's a great place to start. You can start tailoring your message based off of location. Um, you know, weather data is another really great thing to, to use. So there are ways that you can start activating, even with decent data. You just want to, again, make sure that your, your quality of your data is controlling your messaging. So when you start to use the in market and the category and the intent <coughs> signals that we're getting from Facebooks and Googles and DBMs of the world, you can start to understand your consumer a little bit better and feel more confident in having a more specific conversation with them. And then finally, and obviously people-based, um, people not proxies, stuff that M1 allows us to do, and this is where you can really have a, a specific conversation and feel extremely confident in it. Um, one other just honestly tidbit would be like flip these two. If you can't get a lot of really great creative based off of all these amazing data profiles that you've built, look at the creative that your team has sent you and build an audience around that. Which audience is this going to resonate best with? How do I segment that out? And that way at least you're activating based off of that and you're not just throwing out a general messaging to the entire internet population and potentially alienating some people. Um, so again, I realize it's, it's daunting and it's scary, but as Dylan's original slide said, programmatic is a thing. It's here, it's gonna stay, and we have to start finding ways that we can personalize our creative and have conversations with consumers. The other thing to really strongly consider when it comes to programmatic would be the fact that um, it's, it's, as Dylan mentioned, it's growing tremendously. In and, and 2017, Display um, officially took majority share in terms of uh, all of the digital channels with 51% of digital ad spend going to display. If you look at how much that's gonna grow, it might look like it's you know 53% staying flat a little bit, but look at native and video. Overall investment is gonna go up, right? So that's still a growth opportunity. But if you look at this, native is gonna represent over a third of programmatic and display inventory by 2019. How many people in here are using native and video in their programmatic activation today? We've gotten a couple, we've gotten a couple. Again, like, 
Traditional banners are great. We can do a lot with them. But if you're not thinking about other inventory sources and other creative that you need to focus on, you will. the longer you wait, the more farther, farther you'll fall behind. So just make sure that you start keeping that in mind. And again, reach out to your iProspect teams. We can help you with that. Native is super easy to do, right? By nature, it takes the form and function of a website. It's super easy to grab five or six images off of your website. You can grab some search copy from your search team and very easily and quickly create um, a lot of different ad variations. And probably before yesterday, you guys all assumed that you couldn't do dynamic video. But as Jeremy and Tara mentioned on the main stage, Google now gives us the opportunity to create dynamic videos with their director mix um, suite. So you can cut different pieces of your video. You can add different calls to action. You can focus on different products so that you do start to create video relevant ads for each of your consumers. So OK, this is the fun part. Um, this is our audience framework, audience planning framework. You guys saw something similar to this on the main mm -hmm. stage yesterday in Liz's Hollister um, case study that she did for M1. So originally I was gonna spend the last two or three minutes like walking you guys through this, but I think hopefully at this point, the main point we're trying to make is you have to start with your audience profile. You build that first, but once you understand who they are, what they care about, you can adjust your messaging, you can adjust your inventory and your targeting tactics, et cetera. Um, but then we were just kind of thinking last night about like how many how many M1 visuals have you guys seen on PowerPoints? Like a lot. So I just want to pull up the M1 platform. We're just going to use it. We're just going to go build this do-it-yourself profile. Okay. All right. Internet work. Okay. So a couple quick things to call out. First and foremost, you're going to notice this says Wolverine Worldwide. Um, if and when we set you up on M1, you'll get your own system, you'll get your own platform. So again, when you upload your CRM data, um, it's yours. You can save profiles in there. It's, it's yours. You, you don't have to share it with anybody else. Um, second is just quickly call out the two main ways that you can work with M1. One would be, um, as we're going to show you guys here today, is just to use it what we're calling like third party. So we're using the base population, which is essentially 280 million people that live in the M1 platform. You can also upload your CRM data. So I would say that's the more advanced way to do it. When you upload your CRM data into here, all these different attributes that we're about to play with, you can add on to your CRM segment so that you can actually start to understand them further than just the information that you have within your existing platform. So that's a really powerful way to use it. But again, you can just start simply with using the third party data that's already in there. So first and foremost, covering that. The three different sections here. Left is building attributes. This is where we're going to build our audience profile. When Dylan talked about all those 30 different data sources, you're going to see just what that looks like, having 30 different data sources and over 1,000 different attributes here in a second. The middle is the um, insights and the planning. So when we say you can just do basic planning in here, you don't have to do all of the activation. Um, type in all of your information. And as I do this, you guys are going to see all this information change, all these different tabs across the top we can play with. So it starts to tell you more and more about your audience. And this is actually what we used for Pier 1. And I'll tell you guys a little bit about how we did that in a minute. Um, and then third will be the actual activation. So again, watch these numbers change as I'm adding things in here. What this means is, so again, for this example, we have 280 million people in the audience. AOL allows us to reach 73 million of those. So as I build a profile, you're going to see that number change, and you're going to start to see certain publishers that have a higher reach within that audience. And that, that would be how we would go activate it. We would go reach out to those partners. We would publish the audience to those partners, and that allows us to speak to them. Good? Makes sense? All right, let's do it. OK, <coughs> DIY. I just typed in DIY, and look at how many segments there are. Right? Like, you can type in so much stuff here. You can do demographic, male, female, propensity, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but for this instance, just for the sake of time, I know I'm going to be looking for people who enjoy doing DIY projects. Even with this one, you can look at people who do it regularly, passionate about it, flat. We're just going to go with passionate. So you see these numbers start to change. So again, as we add in more information on these consumers, you're going to see this, this number getting smaller typically and these numbers changing. So one of the other really cool data sources we have in here is Visa data. Um, so if I do Visa and home, you're going to see Visa data that gives me insights into people who are likely to spend on home decor. So I'm going to add that in there. Down to 8.4 million people. You can see these numbers start to change. Um, and then the other one that I really like playing around with would be competitor conquesting. So home goods is a really big competitor of Pier 1. They're trying to take back some of that market. Um, so we can add that in there as well. 
You can change and to or if you need to get a little bit more scale. We typically recommend that you start with about four to five million as your base. Um, obviously, you want to make sure you have a big enough audience. You can test around with it. So typically, three to five million is, is your sweet spot. Um, you can also very easily change to a not, so you can exclude audiences. And again, every time you do this, you're seeing the data change IRL. Um, so for Pier 1, what we did was we looked at you know, a lot of this information, and it was a lot to take in. So we were like, how do, how do we use this? Again, how do we start with broad strokes? What we did was we just found that Shockingly enough, there was, um, when we did this, I think it was like a 70% of the audience had children in the household. So we just pulled out some key <coughs> insights, passed it along to their creative team, and they, they created a super cute video. Um, this lady had all these big, beautiful Pier 1 pillows on her couch, um, and then all of a sudden she springs up from underneath the pillows, and her kids come running out, and she starts chasing them. You know, so it's just like creating something that's relevant and meaningful, and it, and it created the idea, that, which is what Pier 1 was trying to communicate, of like, it's your home, it's you, it should be an extension of you, you have a family, blah, 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 blah. So it was really, it was really helpful, and it was really good, and we saw great performance from it. So, um, again, this is something that you can use as a planning tool. We can enter in your customer data, what you think you know about them, and tell you if that is in fact who they are, or potentially help you learn additional things as well. So it's a super fun platform to play around in. I would definitely encourage you guys to ask around about it if you haven't already. And hopefully that helps demystify a little bit the M1 platform. It's a real thing. It's <laughs> not an image on a slide. Um, so just to wrap it up, um, key takeaways. So, Ask about your data. You know, if you're if you're not being transparent with your pricing, your inventory, definitely let us know about that too. But hopefully, a lot of you guys are already digging into that. So the next iteration, ask about your data, understand what's going into it, understand the accuracy of it, um, and play with the quality and quantity. We understand that again, as you saw in this platform, the more you add in, the more you know detailed it's going to be, the harder that is to scale. So play around with some of the opportunities that allow you to scale when you're comfortable with it. Um, and find opportunities to really hone in and have a really specific and, and quality-driven approach. Um, and then again, starting with broad strokes, so refining as you're seeing performance, start with a broad audience, <coughs> test into it, um, grow it out, build it out a little bit more as you feel confident in the performance and in the data. And think about additional ad formats, right? Like as Melissa spoke to, programmatic goes beyond just the banner ad. Uh, you have a tremendous opportunity to extend your personalization into video, into native, into audio, and talk to your consumers in different ways at different points in their customer journey. And that allows you to you know, kind of tweak different levers that are going to uh, enable performance to be vastly different across these different media types. You may find that native is really effective at X and video is really effective at Y, but the point is just don't stop thinking about extending your personalization beyond the banner. And finally, like the biggest thing that I think brands get stuck on a lot of times is don't be afraid to fail. It is okay. Like if we pull together uh, an idea for a creative uh, concept around a particular audience and we don't see the media results that we're looking for, it's all right. Like a negative result is still a positive learning. You can take that information back to your design teams, back to your creative teams and say, look, yeah, here's what we were trying to drive. Here's what we leveraged. Didn't quite work how we wanted to, you know, see things add up, but here's what we learned, and here's what we recommend changing next time. And that's gonna allow you to have a much more data-driven conversation with those teams so that you know that you're making creative decisions based on sound insights instead of just kind of spitballing it. Um, so just to kind of put a bow on things, like if there was one thing to take away from this and go back on Monday and ask your team, like ask them what your top performing data sources are. Ask them what your top performing segments are. We can use that as the basis to build out your personalization strategy and ultimately like, really start to unleash the power of data in programmatic media. Thank you.